So, you got your first camera. Congratulations. You've been searching a lot of reviews on Google. You've saved your hard earned money just to afford that camera and lens. And what now? What do you do? Where do you start? How do you get better? After everything, you finally pulled the trigger. You bought your camera and you bought a lens. Ooh, expensive. Where's my wallet? Non-existent. Oh! That rhymes. But with all the information and learning that you need to do, you end up procrastinating. It's okay, I'm, I'm guilty too, so. So here are the five essential elements of a camera that will make you a better photographer or a videographer. This is just for the people who's trying to begin their photography and videography kind of hobby, but these are still the five essential elements of a camera that professionals still use. Let's get right into it. So the five elements are ISO, aperture, focal length, shutter speed, and white balance. Before we get started with these five elements, you need to keep in mind your exposure. So what I usually use to measure exposure is the exposure meter or the histogram within your camera. Most cameras nowadays have a exposure meter. You usually find it in the bottom of your camera. It's called MM and it shows you the range exposure between minus two to plus two because once you start going above plus two or below negative two, you start to clip details. So then it's gonna be overblown or it's gonna get too dark. So staying in range between that negative two to plus two will give you a safe footage that you can use later on for post-production. But of course, so you want it to be as close as possible to zero. Another tool that I use is the histogram. It's usually located in the bottom right of your camera. If the graph is all the way to the right, that means you're most likely overexposed. If the graph of the histogram is all the way to the left, that means you're probably too dark. The reason why we want it to be in the middle is to retain a lot of details between the shadows and the highlights. Keep in mind of that. So the first one is ISO. ISO is a number that measures how your sensor is sensitive to the light. The higher the number, the more your sensor is sensitive to the light. You want to make sure that your ISO is as low as you can so that you don't introduce a lot of noise once you've start taking photos. What I usually do when taking photos, I don't usually go above 2000 just because I want to reduce the noise level within that photo on post. The higher the ISO, the more noise you introduce for that photo. And for a video, I usually go with the camera's native ISO. You usually find it on the specs. What it means is there is specific ISO number that your camera can do without having too much noise. So let's say for an A7S III, like what I'm filming with right now, that's a native ISO is 640 or 12,800. So usually for video, I do within that 1250 ISO range. I don't go above that in the bright setting. But then when I go to a dark setting, I usually go 12,800, that native ISO for Sony cameras because the amount of noise for that native ISO barely noticeable compared to like, let's say if you move your ISO to 10,000, a lower number, once you compare it side to side, the native ISO wins. So for the video, you wanna stick with a native ISO depending on your camera. So I would highly recommend doing a search on the spec and look for native ISO. So the second one is the shutter speed. Shutter speed is the amount of motion blur you can have on your photo or video. You can find it usually in the bottom of your camera that says one over 50, one over 60, one over 125. It is the speed of the shutter per second. So let's say a one over 250 shutter speed, you will see that the video is more snappier and you can see every detail of your hand. Let's say the shutter speed is one over 50, you will see there's a lot more motion blur introduced on the video. 
And for the photo, once you have a higher shutter speed, you'll have a sharp photo of a fast moving object. We usually have a rule that whatever is your focal length of your lens means you double that as a shutter speed. It's not a very strict rule, but a good thing to know. Let's say if you're doing animal photography, then you're gonna be doing around 200 to even 600 millimeter focal length of your lens. So it makes sense, your shutter speed should be around double of 200, so 400 to 1200. For video, a natural rule is whatever is your FPS, let's say you're shooting at 24 FPS your shutter speed should be double of that. Right now I'm shooting at 24, so then my shutter speed is 50, one over 50. If I'm shooting a slow-mo, so if it's 60, my shutter speed should be 120, one over 120. If it's 120 FPS, then my shutter speed should be around 240 or 250. But you usually wanna go ne as near as double for that. They call it natural motion blur to the human eye. I would really encourage you to go out there and try experimenting with your shutter speed. If you wanna try a high exposure type of photography, you wanna make sure that your shutter speed is slower. Aperture is a mechanism of the lens allows the amount of light that goes to your sensor. So the lower the number, the wider the lens opening, the brighter the image or video going to be. So if you look to your camera, they usually say it as an f-stop or aperture and you'll see it as f2.8, f1.8. If you're trying to buy a camera, you'll see it as let's say 55 millimeter at f1.8. Another aspect of aperture is the lower the number, the more shallow the focus field. That's why they call it shallow depth of field. Also introduce background blur. So right now I'm doing 35 millimeter 1.4 and my background is blurred because of the lower f-stop. Being creative with the f-stop allows you to convey the amount of details you want to present to your audience. So let's say for landscape, you usually wanna do f4 at least so that everything is in focus and your audience will be able to appreciate all the sharp details of the mountain. White balance, the main purpose is to make white colors in the camera become actually white. There is called Kelvin measure, it's K. It's the measurement of the temperature. So the white balance on the setting and in your camera is actually different. The lower the K, the warmer the location is. The higher the Kelvin, the cooler the location is. The reason why the camera is in the opposite scenario, what I mean is that the lower the number on your camera, the footage becomes bluer, and the higher the Kelvin, the temperature, in your camera, it becomes warmer. Is because the camera is trying to compensate on the temperature of the location. Having the white balance to your photography and videography is crucial just because it allows you to actually see the true white on your footage or picture. And one of the most crucial part for white balance on video, you don't want it to be in auto. Because if you put auto, the white balance constantly changes according to each frame. And for photo, yes, you can have an auto white balance. Usually I go manual, just because that I want all my pictures to be constantly in that white balance, so that's easier for post later on. Focal length makes a huge difference in the overall shot of your image and video. The lower the focal length, the wider the shot will be. Hence, the more distorted the image look like or video look like. So right now, I am at 20, 1.8. As you can see, if I put my hands here, it's so distorted. It's so long, it becomes distorted. It's very wide. It's called ultra wide length. And then on the opposite side, the higher the focal length, the more zoomed or narrow the image or video will be, and the more compressed the footage. Your background will be closer to your subject. I actually have a footage here of my friend, Renzo. He helped me take this picture of a 14 millimeter. You'll see Renzo here is distorted. As you can see, his face is a little bit long. His body is a little bit distorted. Adding into that, the background is just the sky. 
but take a look at the 225 millimeter focal length. You see the legislature building actually took over the background. It's because of that compression. The longer the focal length, the closer your background to your subject, hence compression. Adding into that, the more compression, the more blurry background you get. So knowing how focal lengths affect the overall look of your image or video, it can create a huge difference in terms of your creativity. So the most common focal lengths are usually 14 millimeter, 24 millimeter, 35 millimeter, 50, 85, 105, 135, 225. Anything above that is you go into a niche type of photography or videography. They tend to be in the sports, animal photography, anything around that area that requires a lot of zoom, then you go towards like, let's say 200 to 300 to 400 to 600. So for beginners, I would definitely recommend a zoom lens first so that you can play around with your creativity and like what kind of taste of focal length you like most. Usually even everyone says this on the YouTube that you start with a 24 to 70 because you have the flexibility of a 24 millimeter, which is a wide angle lens, and then a 70 millimeter, which is a portrait lens. Knowing your focal length makes a ton of difference in terms of storytelling. To keep in mind, for you beginners out there, having let's say a kit lens that is 28 to 75, this is good enough if you're in a tight budget, but I would definitely, definitely recommend a 24 to 70 f 2.8. Let's say for Sony right now, I know for sure that you can do a Sigma art lens that is 24 to 70 millimeter at 2.8, so it's good for low light. And then once you know your focal length, you can probably do a prime lens, let's say a 24 1.4, 85 1.4, 55 1.4. These prime lenses cost like a liver or cost like a kidney. So yeah, start with 24 to 70, no regrets. All right, so after covering all those five elements and on how it affects your photography and videography, thank you so much for you know, getting into this point of the video. A lot of professionals in this field still goes back to the basics of the camera because it is essential. It, you use it every time. What makes them stand out from a regular photographer or videographer is that they can manipulate these settings with intention correlated to their creative vision and purpose. So it's time for you to do it. If you're just starting out, I would highly encourage to take it slow and take time to learn these elements one by one and see how they correlate to each other and how they play on the creative storytelling to make an epic video, to make a cinematic video, a very fast one or a very unique type of footage or photo. Because in the end, we want to be the best of ourselves and we want to be great at what we are doing. All right, so uh, thank you so much for watching uh, up to this point of the video. If you like the content, please consider subscribing. I would really appreciate it as I do more reviews, how-to videos, cinematic videos, epic videos, how-to, and something that is a bit more inspiring and creative to you guys. So please subscribe, hit the like button for the YouTube algorithm, or if you actually like the video, please hit the like or comment down below so that I know that you enjoy it or if you don't enjoy it, you know, if I messed up or anything like that. All right, so yeah, so see you next time. Arigato, peace.